in this, the saints are our great example because the saints show to us that this possibility of holiness, of living a life of virtue, of living a life of in pursuit of what is good and true and beautiful is actually on offer. That it's not some sort of decoy or ploy, but that is what the Lord is working out in our lives, in each of our lives, in the particular circumstances of who we are as his beloved children and the circumstances that we might find ourselves in. Welcome back to the Stand Firm Project. I'm Father Jacob Bertrand Jancic, and I'm a Dominican friar of the province of St. Joseph. And today, I want to talk a little bit about virtue, what it is and what it isn't particularly, where it fits into our practice of the faith, and more importantly, our relationship with Christ. When we talk about the faith, when we talk about living the faith, especially when we talk about pursuing goodness and truth and beauty, often a topic or a theme or a word, a thing that comes up is is just that, is, is virtue. And we hear it often, but we might not have a good grasp of why it is and what it is. So let's look at it. Let's talk about it a little bit. If we look at the grand scheme of the whole narrative of salvation history. We can think about it kind of in, in two divisions. And this was, this was presented to me by a scripture professor that I had when I was in seminary. If we look at the scriptures, we can make, it, uh, we can make a division into two, into two parts. The first part being Genesis 1 through 3, and the second part being Genesis 4 through the end of the book of Revelation. And why? Well, Genesis 1 through 3, we're given the creation narratives and the fall. And then the rest of the scriptures, the, la- the rest of our Lord's work in salvation history is about recreating us in his grace, about reintroducing what was lost in the fall. So if we look at who we were, who we were before the fall, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve were created in a state of, of grace. And I want to make one point about this. When we consider what grace is, uh, we have have to recognize that grace is nothing but the divine life given, shared with us. It's not something that's unnatural to us in the sense of it doesn't make us something other than what we are, but it's also not something that's natural to us in the sense of it's not part of our human nature. Rather, it's what we call co-natural or con-natural to us. It's a gift given by God that, that allows our humanity to flourish in the way that God had intended and created it to be from the beginning of time. With sin, with the fall, that that gift of grace, that connatural ability by which we flourish, by which we share in God's divine life, is lost. And God works through his providence, through his loving care for us, through his, through his mercy, to rewrite what had gone wrong due to our sin. And he does so through the course of history by giving, uh, by giving the Israelites the law, the prophets, all that he gives in the Old Covenant— But in the fullness of time, as we well know, he gives us his son who comes to sacrifice his life and to pour out his his grace, his love, his mercy from the cross such that what was damaged by sin might might be repaired by his gift. And so then we can think about, okay, here comes our Lord who who is born, who becomes a man, who lives on earth, shares in all that we are but for sin, who dies and rises from the grave so as to offer us new life in new life in, in him. And he does so by means of his grace. And that grace is given to us through the sacraments of the church. That grace is poured out in the sacraments of the church, most especially and first and foremost in the grace of baptism that sacrament that forgives us our sin, but more importantly, reintroduces, recreates that divine relationship with, with, our, with our Heavenly Father. And in that grace, in, in, through that grace, in, that, in the sacrament of baptism, we're given, for the first time, the fullness of the virtues. Here we can think of the big seven, the three theological virtues and the four cardinal virtues, faith, hope, charity, and then justice, prudence, temperance, and fortitude. Now, there are a whole host of other virtues that fall under each of those seven. But the idea, the reality of the virtues is that they they enable us to act in a way that is conformed to Christ 
and helps us to live a life of goodness, of holiness. They are stable dispositions to act in a particular way. So when we have the virtues, when we're given these, these tools, faith, hope, charity, justice, prudence, temperance, fortitude, they help change our lives, augment our lives, so that we might, in each circumstance, act for the good. They dispose us, make us ready to choose God and the things of God, such that everything that we do as, as men and women might redound to his glory and our holiness. Now, let's take an example to, to better understand how it is that, that the virtues help us, help us to live a life of holiness, or at least pursue a life of holiness. We can look at a sort of spectrum that I find to be really helpful to illustrate here. When we look at how we as human beings interact with the world, the spectrum of, of vice or sin and, and goodness. Um, and we can take, let's for, take for example, uh, the virtue of, of fortitude, the virtue of, of courage that, the, that enables us, that enables us to, to stand firm, to hold the faith, especially in the face, face of death, or in difficult situations. And if we look at this sort of spectrum of, of human action, how it is that, that, we, that we behave, we sort of have, what, options, right? So at, on the one end, we have um, the vicious option, or we can talk about vice, and, and, and really what it means to be vicious, what it be, means to, to have a vice is to choose the bad thing as if it were the good thing to be chosen to do the bad thing as if it were the right thing. So there are no moral like qualms, no back and forth. Ah, oh, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I should. So with respect to fortitude, it's, it's just to act um, cowardly as if that were the good thing, to cower in fear as if that were how we we're supposed to behave. Now, if we move up the scale away from this, this, this vice, more towards virtue, the next sort of step or, or level that we arrive at is, is what we call incontinence or the incontinent person. Now, the incontinent person, like the vicious person, does, does the, the, the bad thing or does the, the vicious thing, but there is a battle. There is a struggle. It's sort of a, a pang of conscience to do the right thing. So we, the, the incontinent, incontinent person may still cower in fear, but debates. Should I act courageously? Should I act boldly in this moment? Okay, so we have the vicious, the incontinent, and now we move to the continent person. The continent person does the good thing. In this case, in our example, behaves courageously, acts with, with fortitude, such that um, the, the virtuous act is done, but there's still a struggle to do what is virtuous. There's still the difficulty, the challenge to act virtuously. So we see we're moving towards the good, but there's still this, this struggle. Now, the last, so vi vicious, incontinent, continent. Now we move to the virtuous person. The virtuous person, as in our example, behaves courageously, acts with great fortitude, um, joyfully, promptly, and easily, as if there were no other choice. Not because freedom is impinged upon, but because because by grace, we as men and women are so conformed to what is good that we can pursue it easily and readily. Now, sometimes when we think about the life of virtue, about doing the good thing in whatever circumstance it might be, we might think that the fullness of virtue is found in, in the continent person, where we do the good thing, but there's, there's some struggle to arrive at it. But I would put forth to you, and it's not my own idea, it's, it's within our great tradition of our faith, that in fact, what God is aiming for in our life. What, what the reality of grace is working for is not for us to struggle, though that struggle may be long, long standing and something that we really have to strive for, but to arrive at this, this perfect virtue, to live a life of faith, hope, and love, justice, prudence, temperance, fortitude, in such a way that we can respond to the difficulties and trials, the temptations of our lives, joyfully, promptly, and easily. That there isn't to be a struggle in the end in our pursuit of goodness and truth and beauty. So if we look at what it is that Christ offers in his grace, what it is that in his offer of the virtues, his strength, his mercy that he pours out for us, is the hope and the reality that this hope would be fulfilled, that in him, in 
cooperating with his grace throughout our lives and frequenting the sacraments and receiving his grace and receiving his mercy, we are more and more conformed to him. We're more and more conformed to him such that we, as men and women, might flourish, that our humanity might be an occasion of of joy and happiness in communion with the divine, with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In this, the saints are our great example because the saints show to us that this possibility of holiness, of living a life of virtue, of living a life of in pursuit of what is good and true and beautiful is actually on offer. That it's not some sort of decoy or ploy, but that is what the Lord is working out in our lives, in each of our lives, in the particular circumstances of who we are as his beloved children and the circumstances that we might find ourselves in. Grace moves us to share in his life, to be conformed to him, to live as he does, to suffer and bear the cross as he does so as to rise with him to be his friend. And there's no greater invitation than that, than friendship with God, than living with him and all his goodness and all his beauty. So pray for that. Pray for the virtues. Pray that our Lord might continually and abundantly shower you with his gifts, draw you into his life, and conform you to him. Thanks so much for tuning in. Please pray for me. Know of my prayers for you all. Like and subscribe to the Stanford Project wherever you're listening. Take care. God bless.